Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, lecture 28 is going to be entitled the Chinese Remainder Theorem, and the statement proof and some applications of the Chinese Remainder Theorem we'll actually see in the next video of lecture 28. Uh, in the current video, I want to talk a little bit more about cyclic groups and their connection to direct products. So actually, section 9.2 uh, which is what we'll, we'll attach ourselves to that in uh, Tom Judson's textbook here, because our series follows Judson's textbook, but this lecture 28 is actually all over the place. Uh, this section is actually in 9.2. Our discussion about the Chinese remainder theorem, we want to attach to section 9.2, but actually in Judson's textbook, uh, the Chinese remainder theorem is actually talked very briefly about in chapter 16. Uh, we're not going to do a full coverage chapter 16. And then we'll also talk about the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, uh, which is talked about in chapter 13, which again, we're going to just introduce all of these ideas here in section 9.2 about direct products. All of these are quite re relevant to direct products. Now, formally in our series, we defined direct products a long time ago, uh, but this is the official location in Judson's textbook. We defined them. We've already introduced that. Uh, what I want to do in this video is in fact prove a very useful statement about the order of direct products. In particular, suppose we have the direct product of two groups, G times H. And if we pick an arbitrary element of G times H, let's call it G comma H, little g comma little h. If we know the order of G little g, let's say it's R inside of capital G, and let's say little h has order S inside of capital H, right? And of course, R and S are integers here. If we know the orders of the two terms in the ordered pair, then the order of the pair in the direct product will be the least common multiple of R and S. So in other words, the order of G times uh, G and H, excuse me, in the direct product, this will be the LCM of the order of G times the order of H individually. Whoops. Like so. So that's what we want to compute here. So for the sake of argument, uh, I guess it's just for the sake of simplicity, let's call the LCM, the least common multiple of R and S, let's call it little m. And so let's consider what happens if we raise G to the m power. Well, m is a common multiple of R and S, which is to say that R divides m. We know by Lagrange's theorem that any multiple of the order of G will give you the identity. So G to the m is equal to the identity. And by similar reasoning, we know that S divides M, therefore, same argument as before, H to the M will also equal the identity of H. Now, the identities in play here might not be the same identity. We have the identity inside of G, and we have the identity inside of H, but Lagrange's theorem would apply to all of these all of these groups here. So what we've now shown here is if we take G comma H and raise it to the M power, this will equal, well, just by usual pro, uh, compo composite, composite multiplication of the direct product, g h to the m will equal g to the m comma h to the m which those are both identities and that is the identity element of g cross h so we see that the order the order of the element is going to be dividing m right here okay now let's say that the order of g comma h it, it's some integer of course let's say it's equal to to uh, k for a moment then we know that k is going to divide m. Great. Which these are both positive integers. So one thing, two things are going to happen here. One of two things, I should say. Either k is equal to the m, which is what we're trying to show, or k is actually less than m. So let's consider that situation for a moment. What if k is strictly less than m? Well, since k is less than m and m was the least common multiple of r and s, that means that either r doesn't divide k or s doesn't divide k. And so without the loss of generality, let's assume that R doesn't divide K. Well, that would mean that G to the K is not the identity because it's not a multiple of R. And so if we take G H to the K power, well, that's G K H K. This won't equal the identity. It won't uh, because the first parameter G to the K is not equal to the identity. So that would, that would sort of contradict the fact that K was the, K was the, uh, order of the element right here. Therefore, m is the smallest possible positive integer, which takes uh, g h to the identity, and therefore it will have to be the 
the, it has to be the order of the elements proving the theorem we then are trying to prove right here. Um, as a very quick corollary, uh, if we have an arbitrary direct product, right? That is, uh, we have n many terms. So we have like G1 times G2 uh, times G3 all the way up to, you know, GN right here. So if we have n factors in this direct product, how do you compute the order? Well, it's a simple induction argument that I'll leave it for the viewer to convince themselves that uh, convince themselves of. If you take the order of this n tuple, the order will be the least common multiple of the orders of each of the individual terms inside of that n tuple. So let's see an example of this real quick. Uh, consider the group Z12 crosses Z60. So we take the cyclic group of order 12 and cross it with the cyclic group of order 60. And let's take the specific elements 8, 56 inside of that group. Well, how do we compute the order of 8 inside of Z12? As we've seen previously, we want to compute the least common, or the greatest common divisor, excuse me, between the element 8 and the order of the cyclic group 12. That's going to be 4. And therefore, the order of 8 inside of Z12 will be the order 12 divided by that GCD 4, which says that 8 is an element of order 3. And that's not, you know, if you actually look at it, it's not too hard, right? So you have 8 here, the cyclic subgroup generated by 8. You get 0, you get 8. You get, um, if you add 8 to 8, you get 16, which is, which is congruent to 4. And then 8 plus 4 is 12, which is 0 again. So that's the cyclic group generated by 8. It's order 3. Great. We could have done that by hand, but we also have a formula for it. Um, likewise, let's consider the order of 56 inside of Z60. By a similar computation, the GCD of 56 and 60 is likewise 4. Therefore, the order of 56 will be 60 divided by 4, which is 15. And so then highlighting those things right there, the order of 8 inside of Z12 is 3. The order of 56 inside of Z60 is 15. And so the least common multiple of 3 and 15 will be 15. Notice that in this situation, 3 actually divides 15 since it's 3 times 5 right there. So the LCM would be 15. And so the order of the element 8 and 56, that's an element of order 15 inside of Z12 cross Z60. Let's look at another example. Uh, if we take Z2 cross Z3, and let's take the element, so this, so Z2 is, of course, the cyclic group of order 2, Z3 is the cyclic group of order 3. So their product will form an abelian group of order 6. Uh, let's consider the element 1, 1 inside of Z2 cross Z3. Now, to compute the order of 1, we probably don't need to do it since we know 1 generates these uh, cyclic groups with respect to modular addition every time. But, you know, if you went through the argument, the GCD of 1 and 2, of course, is 1. 2 divided by 1 is equal to 1, and therefore the order of 1... The order of one, let me make that look like a one. The order of one is going to be one, uh, excuse me, it's going to be two. What the, what's going on there? That should be two. Uh, and we're viewing this as an element inside of Z2. Uh, likewise, if we compute the GCD of one and three, that, of course, is also one, right? And so by similar reasoning, uh, you see that uh, we see that in Z3, the element one will likewise have order three. And that should also be a one. Sorry about the typos here. So then when you look at that together, the the GC or the LCM, excuse me, least common multiple of one and one, uh, well, that's just the, the order of one and one, which will be the least common multiple of two and three, that's going to equal the element six. So one comma one is an element of order six. All right. But like I said earlier, Z2 times Z3, that's a group of order 6, 2 times 3. If you're looking for the order of a direct product, G and H, this is always just equal to the order of G times the order of H. So Z2 cross Z3 is a group of order 6, but it contains an element of order 6. That would suggest that the group is actually cyclic. And as we've seen previously, all cyclic groups are, are isomorphic up to their orders. That means Z2 cross Z3, it's a cyclic group of order 6. It has to be isomorphic to Z6. And in fact, the way the isomorphism is, if you go from Z6, so we're going to go from Z6 to Z2 cross Z3, the map is just send n to n comma n, right? And reduce mod 2 and 3 respectively. So if you were to go through all the possible elements, let's actually look at the details of this really quickly. You get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right here, right? So 0 will map to 0, 0. Great. Um, one would map to one, one, no reduction there. Two would map to two, two, which that reduces to zero 
and 2. 3 would map to 3, 3, which reduces to be 1 and 0. Uh, then we get 4 would map to 4, 4, which reduces down to be 0, comma, two, uh, 1, excuse me. And then the last one, if you take 5, comma, 5, that would reduce down to be 1, comma, 2. And so we see here the six possible pairs between Z2 and Z3. So it turns out the product of these two cyclic groups, direct product, turned out to be cyclic. That's not always the case, though. One can, in fact, argue that Z12 crosses Z60 is not a cyclic group, and that's what will lead us to the Chinese remainder theorem in the very next video.